Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Tron. Welcome to our service uh, this evening. It's good to see you. Hope that uh, after the service you won't rush away. There'll be tea and coffee downstairs and uh, an opportunity to share fellowship with one another and meet and greet one another. If you're new, if it's your first time with us, then a very particular welcome. And uh, we hope you'll feel at home with us here among God's people. This evening, uh, we're starting a new series. Ed was starting a new preaching series on the book of Amos, the roar of the lion, God roaring from the heavens through his prophet Amos. And in the middle of the book, we read these words, He who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Well, we're going to begin by singing a hymn of praise to this God, the God of hosts, the God of our fathers, creator and Lord, majestic in glory by heavens adored. Well, as we sit then, let's pray together. Let's pray. We come before you, O God, God of our fathers, who formed the mountains, created the wind, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. God of the hosts of heaven, the armies of heaven, and God who declares to man 
what is his thought, who has drawn near to us to speak to us, to reveal yourself to us, that we should not be in the darkness, that we should not be seeking, searching, trying to find out for ourselves the truth about a God who is great and lofty and magnificent, but distant and unknown and unknowable. But you are the God who has from the beginning come down to reveal yourself to us. You are the God who does nothing without revealing himself through his prophets. And from earliest days to our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to your people Israel, through the words of the prophets, the seers, the poets, the psalmists, you have come and spoken the word that reveals your truest and deepest heart and spoken it to us in a language that all can understand from the greatest to the least, not in words of high-minded theological argument, but down-to-earth words of human speech that the meanest may understand yet words that convey great, abundant, mighty truths to exercise the minds of the greatest on earth and never fully to fathom your greatness, your power, your love and the all-encompassing wonder of your kingdom. But Lord, we have this great privilege of knowing you through your word and above all of knowing you through the word made flesh ultimately in the Lord Jesus Christ who like a prism brings all these colors and shades of the light of your precious revelation and focuses it in the bright, burning, pure light as you yourself made yourself known upon this earth in the flesh to men and women and boys and girls and spoke the words of life and light and truth. Father, how we thank you that you are a speaking God, that you draw near to us, that you persist in penetrating the darkness of our selfish hearts the desires that are perpetual within us to rule ourselves, to turn from you, to seek wisdom anywhere but the wisdom of heaven. But you are a God who will never let us go. You've come to us again and again to speak that word of power and truth, to awaken in our hearts a response to your grace. You have not rested until you have become the God of our own hearts, our Redeemer and King, who came for us to save us and redeem us and make us yours. We should know the joy of your heaven forever. So, Lord, we thank you for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the clarity, for the truth that leads us in the way everlasting. But we thank you also for all the words of the prophets that are preserved for us in these Bibles in front of us. That as your Apostle Peter tells us, are like a bright lamp shining in our pathway until the day finally breaks and we no longer need the word of revelation for your presence will at last return to this earth. Now we thank you for every word inscribed in Scripture for us, to guide us, to lead us, to answer our questions, to lead our thought, and to help us to respond with pure hearts and with loving faithfulness as the people that you have called us to be. And we pray tonight that as we begin a study in this prophet Amos, from so long ago, yet the privilege that he carried of living words from heaven, 
means that we can still come today and find in these words before us a living word for us today. And so we ask, Lord, that every one of us gathered here this evening would find just that, that as we come seeking with honest, open, and humble hearts, you would speak to us a word of truth and power, a word of wisdom, a word to lift us and to lead us in the way everlasting. So come to us, Lord, we pray. Help us to be responsive people. Speak to us that we may speak back to you from lips that praise your name and above all from lives that radiate your goodness and bear fruit for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing once again. This time it's a psalm. You'll find it in our blue books here at number 23. It's uh, obviously a version of Psalm 23. You'll see that there are three of them. And we're singing the middle one, 23b. And uh, you'll notice that when we sing it to this tune, that uh, we repeat the last two lines of each verse. Uh, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. Number 23b. Well, friends, we're just about to come to our reading from the Scriptures in a moment. But first of all, I want to give you a book review. We have a book of the month 
I think we always have a book of the month, but we've certainly got a book of a month this month. And the book of the month is Why We Pray by that 16th century author. No, <laughs> William Philip. William Philip is the author. Um, some of you would have seen this. I, I guess some of you will have read it, but I do want to recommend it very much. I think we've got plenty of copies of it downstairs. It is quite the most encouraging book on prayer that I have read for many years, and I have read a few. And I think one reason why William wrote this book for us and, and for others was because books on prayer tend to make you feel burdened and guilty that you haven't got up at five o'clock in the morning to pray for three hours before you go to work or whatever. Uh, but this, this has the opposite effect. This, this is a really encouraging book, helping us to see the reasons why Christians pray. And that's why Willie has given it the title, Why We Pray, not How to Pray. It's Why We Pray. And uh, he dwells upon the fact that because God speaks to us and we're made in God's image, it's natural that we should speak back to him and that God has given us the right as sons and heirs of God to approach him, not because we are good, but because God himself loves us and loves to hear us pray. So do buy this. I think you will find it very encouraging. And if, like me, you're a person who finds regular prayer quite difficult, I think this will stimulate your prayer life uh, very much so. And thank you, Willie, for writing it for us. Well, let's turn now to our reading, which is the prophet Amos. And you'll find him on page 764 of our church Bibles, if you have the big church Bible. The prophet Amos, I'm going to read chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 3, tonight. <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 3. And you'll see that after the opening two verses, this passage falls into six sections, more or less of equal length, where the Lord God, through the prophet Amos, addresses various Gentile nations who are living very close to the land of Israel and Judah. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire upon the house of Hazael and it shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. I will break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Aven and him who holds the scepter from Beth Eden and the people of Syria shall go into exile to Kir, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them up to Edom. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza and it shall devour her strongholds. I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod and him who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, and it shall devour her strongholds. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Because he pursued his brother with the sword, and cast off all pity, and his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire upon Teman, and it shall devour the strongholds of Bozrah. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the Ammonites and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead that they might enlarge their border. So I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah and it shall devour her strongholds with shouting on the day of battle, with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind and their king shall go into exile, he and his princes together, says the Lord." Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab 
and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. So I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the strongholds of Kerioth, and Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting and the sound of the trumpet. I will cut off the ruler from its midst, and will kill all its princes with him, says the Lord. Amen. The word of the Lord. Well, now we're going to sing together again. Let's turn in our hymn books to number 737, a lovely hymn which we've sung a number of times in recent years, written by Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, back in about 400 AD. O matchless beauty of our God, so ancient and so new, kindle in us your fire of love, fall on us as the dew. Number 737. Well, now our offering in support of the Lord's Gospel work will be taken up, and uh, the musicians will play. And you might like to read again through that first chapter of Amos while we have uh, some quiet moments.
Well, let us bow our heads together for some further moments of prayer. As we lift our minds and our hearts together as a congregation to the wonderful Lord God, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of all the beauty that we see around us on a lovely spring day like this, and the one who sent to us our Savior Jesus at our time of desperate need and impotence and helplessness, the God who loves us, to whom we can turn, to whom we can indeed pray, because we come to him as sons and heirs. The book of Amos has much to say in judgment of God's people, but it ends with a great promise of future salvation. But amongst the hard words that Amos has to pass on to God's people are these ones from chapter 8. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. People shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much that the word of the Lord is in our hands and you have made it possible for us to hear from you. We think of the Bibles which are open in front of us and the the many millions of them which are in these British islands and indeed in many, many countries of the world. But we're conscious, dear Father, that part of your judgment against the people of Israel many years ago was that the voice of prophecy bringing the words of God, would be silent, at least for a while, because of your judgment against the hardness of heart in your own people. And we think of parts of the world now where the word of the Lord, where the Bible is forbidden or hated, where people's hearts turn against what you have to say. So we do want to pray, our dear Heavenly Father, that your words, the words conveyed to us in Scripture itself, should become more and more available around the world. We want to thank you so much for those who have put the Bible into our hands. We think of those who have labored over many generations to put English Bibles into the hands of those who speak English. We think of William Tyndale and of other great workers back in the days of the Reformation who labored to bring the Bible into the hands of ordinary English-speaking people up and down the land. We think of those who have published Bibles and distributed them all over the world for centuries. We think of those who even now are deeply concerned with the translation and publication and distribution of the words of God. We think of our friends friends and colleagues who work in northern India in the fellowship of the Delhi Bible Institute, and we want to pray for them as they continue their evangelistic work. We do thank you for the work that Uh, Our own dear friends, uh, David and Julie Robery, are involved in in Nigeria. We think of David uh, helping with the translation of the Bible into a number of different Nigerian languages, and we pray that you will bless that work. We thank you too, dear Father, for those who train preachers and teachers of the Bible, those who train and encourage youth leaders and Sunday school teachers, And we want to pray too, dear Father, against the power and influence of those who would seek to gag the Bible, to stop its publication and to stop people from reading it. We pray for ourselves that you will help us in this congregation to be joyfully unashamed of every phrase, every word, every thought conveyed in the Bible. Give us, therefore, dear Father, a deeper hunger for your truth, a growing understanding of it, a growing ability and willingness to share it with each other and to encourage each other to stand with Scripture against the ways of the world. And we pray that this church, this congregation, may increasingly be a banner for the truth as people see and hear uh, the the transforming power of the gospel through the Scriptures at work in the lives and hearts of many people. May it not be true Dear Father, that there is a famine of your words in this country. Please help us to work against such a dreadful scenario 
and give us fresh energy for the cause we pray. And all these things we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, let's turn now in our hymn books to number 534, 534. On this assembled host, in this accepted hour, O Spirit, as at Pentecost, descend in all your power. It's a prayer to the Holy Spirit to help us and to teach us. Number 534. Let's turn again to the book of Amos, chapter 1, page 764 in our church Bibles. And my title for this evening is God is the Judge of All the Earth. I'm giving a title to the whole series of sermons, which I'm calling The Roaring of the Lion, for reasons which we shall soon see. So the judgment of of all the earth tonight. Now this man Amos and the book that bears his name date from about 760 BC. And therefore many people who read Amos today would want to write him off as ancient history, as dead as the woolly mammoth. But as soon as you actually begin to read the prophet Amos, you realize that he is dealing with subjects of perpetual interest and perpetual urgency. In fact, in this very first chapter, he speaks of slavery. Well, that still goes on, doesn't it? He speaks of people trafficking, of the breaking of international treaties. He speaks of barbarous atrocities, such as the ripping open of pregnant women. It all sounds so contemporary. It's the way people behave today. 
In fact, this first chapter of Amos reads very much like a bulletin of the BBC's six o'clock news, with this exception, that it records not only horrible human behavior, but also the fact that God is going to judge and punish the perpetrators of these things. Now, the book of Amos is a book about God's judgment of wicked human behavior. And I want to show how this is a deeply comforting and encouraging message for us, but at the same time, a message that will make us very thoughtful about the God who is to be feared as well as trusted. Well, let me start off by a little bit of historical scene setting. Can you imagine a situation where you have two comparatively small nations which are united, but united rather uncomfortably. Can you think of that? We don't have to look very far afield, do we? I guess England and Scotland. Well, think of the history. We have known terrible times of bloodshed and warfare. It must have been deeply unsettling to have been alive in the days of Wallace and Bruce and Edward I. But there have been some pretty rough times since then, have there not? Think of the 18th century, for example. Would the Jacobite uprisings succeed in re-establishing the Stuart kings? Or was the House of Hanover with its German kings, the Georges, going to become established? More blood was shed, more bitterness was created. And yes, a union was formed between England and Scotland. But that union, as we know, is again under threat. And whether we voted yes or no in last last year's referendum, I guess we all feel a bit uncomfortable about the longer term future. Now, I mentioned Scotland and England simply because they provide a parallel with what was going on in the Promised Land in Amos' day. The people of Israel, under Joshua's leadership, had crossed the River Jordan into the land of Canaan in about 1400 BC. 400 years later, in 1000 BC, David had come to the throne, and David was able to consolidate the whole kingdom into one political entity, all the way from Dan to Beersheba, as we might say in this country, all the way from John O'Groats to Land's End. It was one kingdom. It was centered upon its capital city, Jerusalem, the city of David, the city of God. David reigned for about 40 years, and he was succeeded by his son Solomon, who also reigned for about 40 years. So there was 80 years of unity. Then Solomon died, He was succeeded by his unwise son, Rehoboam, and the kingdom quickly became divided into two kingdoms. Let's have a look at the map on the screen, if we may, please. (laughs) There we have it. Good. Now, you'll see there we have the two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Now, Jerusalem, just south of the border between the two countries, that continued to be the capital of Judah, and Samaria became the capital of uh, Israel. And you'll see this very division, just keep it up there, Johnny, for a moment. You'll see this division reflected in the very first verse of the book of Amos. Have a look at verse 1. In the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Now, friends, even if history is not your pin-up subject, you do need to get this division of Israel and Judah firmly into the inside of your head. Otherwise, there will be large parts of Old Testament history that you will understand as well as my dog understands higher mathematics. Now, let's notice one or two other historical points. Uzziah, king of Judah, reigned from 791 BC to 740 BC. And Jeroboam, the son of Joash, reigned in Israel from 791 to 753. So the two kings died in 740 and 753. So Amos's work of preaching happened during the first half of that particular century, the 8th century BC. But you'll see there's a precise note at the end of verse 1, two years before the earthquake. Now that must have been a memorable and dreadful earthquake because the prophet Zechariah mentions the same earthquake in his book some 250 years later. It must have been a huge event as memorable as the Black Death in Europe or the the Irish potato famine, something big and destructive. And archaeologists record that this earthquake probably happened in about the year 760 BC, and that gives us a fairly precise date for the book of Amos. 
Thanks, Johnny. <clears throat> well, so much for the, the bare bones of the historical setting. What about the man Amos himself? Well, let's notice two things about him in particular. First, he was a farmer. Verse 1 tells us that he was from among the shepherds of Tekoa. And later in the book, in chapter 7, we learn that he was also a grower of sycamore fig trees. So his regular work was food production, the production of figs and mutton and wool. But he says this in chapter 7, the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, go, prophesy to my people Israel. So that means he hadn't been trained in the ways of the prophets. He hadn't been a, a ministry apprentice. He hadn't been to the Cornhill training course in Jerusalem. And that makes his call to be a prophet all the more impressive. There were schools of prophets uh, uh, in those days in Israel, but Amos clearly had not been part of that kind of setup. The Lord had extracted him from his farming and had sent him with a most challenging message to the people of Israel north of the border. And we shall see as we study this book just how courageous he had to be so as to discharge his commission. So that's the first thing, he was a farmer. Secondly, he was one of the earliest cross-cultural missionaries. Verse 1 here tells us that he was from Tekoa, and Tekoa was in the land of Judah, not far from Jerusalem. But he was sent by the Lord from Tekoa in Judah, northwards across the border, into Israel. And that was dangerous because of the hostile relationships between Israel and Judah. In fact, in chapter 7, there's a pompous man who appears, the priest of Bethel, a man called Amaziah. And he says to Amos, run back to Judah, you seer, and prophesy there. Earn your bread there if you must, but shut your carbuncle of a mouth in Israel. He doesn't quite use exactly that language, but that's certainly what he means. Now, Amos's contemporary, Jonah, was also an international missionary. As you know, he was sent to Nineveh, much further away. But in sending Amos to Israel, the Lord helps us to see just how important Israel was to him. Well, let's turn from the history of the man to what the man said. And this, of course, is the really important thing, because the words of Amos are, of, are the words of God, God's own message. The message of the book of Amos is God's message to the people of Israel in 760 B.C., but it remains God's message to us today, to the people of the 21st century A.D., because God is today exactly as he was in the days of Amos. He is unchanged, and Amos's words will tell us a lot about God. So let's notice verse 2, because verse 2 colors the whole book of Amos. It's rather like a heading for the whole prophecy. And if you can listen to verse 2 without trembling just a little bit, you have a thick skin. And he said, that's Amos, and Amos said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. Consequence, the pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. Now, if you look at a Bible atlas, you will see that the distance between Jerusalem and Mount Carmel is something like 60 miles. So what God has to say from his city, Jerusalem, is directed northwards right up to Mount Carmel at the northern extreme of Israel. And his voice, as well as being the roar of a lion, is a bit like a flamethrower here. The vegetation right across the land withers under the blast. Amos is saying that the Lord's message to Israel is one of imminent judgment, indeed destruction. And you'll see that Amos likens the Lord God to a lion, and this lion is roaring. And the Hebrew language experts will tell us that the word used here for roaring means the pouncing roar that a lion makes just at the moment that it leaps upon its prey. Now, it's worth dwelling on this roaring of the lion for a moment. Lions, you won't find lions in Israel today, but lions were common throughout the Middle East in those days. In fact, there were lions in the land of Syria right up to about 1850 AD, in other words, less than 200 years ago. And if you were a shepherd like Amos, responsible for flocks of sheep, you would have known only too well what a hungry lion can do to sheep. Just look across the page to, or over the page, to chapter 3, verse 12. Here's a shepherd speaking. 3.12, thus says the Lord, as the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs, or a piece of an ear, 
so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and part of a bed. Now Amos is surely speaking from experience there as he remembers the bitter pain of picking up the remains of a valuable sheep after a lion has been raiding just a bit of bone and ear. And Amos must have heard lions roaring close to his farm almost every night. A lion's roar is a terrifying sound. Apparently, if you're very close to it, the very ground under your feet trembles. Years ago, um, I was on a wilderness, a wilderness trekking expedition in South Africa in game reserves there. For several nights, I, I was in a Bedford van with a few others, and we were sleeping out every night under the stars in sleeping bags, no tents, just out under the stars. And one night, with nothing between me and the wilderness but half an inch of sleeping bag, I heard lions roaring. Now, these lions were at least a mile away, but I literally, physically trembled in my sleeping bag as I heard this noise. Even at a mile's distance, it's a sound of unbelievable ferocity and menace. And what Amos says here in chapter 1, verse 2, is addressed to people who, like him, had often heard the lions roaring. They knew that it was a terrifying sound. And by prefacing his whole prophecy with this verse, Amos is warning his listeners that the message of his sermons is a message that the Lord is roaring like a lion. His displeasure with Israel has reached a point of explosion. Judgment, therefore, is imminent. And let me offer you a crumb of comfort at this stage. The prophecies of judgment in the Bible, and this includes the prophecies of Jesus about judgment, they all proceed ultimately from God's mercy. Now, this is exactly what we see in the preaching of Jesus. Just think of that famous summary of his preaching, which Mark gives us in his first chapter. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, therefore. The kingdom of God is at hand means that the judgment of God is pressing at the gates. The king is the judge. The king is here. Jesus is the king and the judge. So repent while a moment of opportunity remains. Repent and believe the good news and be forgiven and saved. Now that's the message of Amos to Israel. The lion is roaring. He's ready to destroy. Seek him and live therefore. Don't persist in your hard-heartedness against him. Now, over these coming weeks, as we work our way through this book, we'll be seeing a number of judgments threatened by the Lord in, in the book of Amos. And it is right that we should tremble before them. But let's never forget that behind the threatened judgment is the mercy of God. Now, it's not difficult, really, to understand this. Just think of the loving father or mother shouting at their child, Richard! If you strike that match near that can of petrol, I shall box your ears. Now, that's a threat of judgment, isn't it? But it proceeds from love. The loving parent threatens the judgment because he wants the child to avoid disaster. Behind the judgment is the mercy. Now, of course, the, God's, God's words about judgment are no idle threat. If there's no response of repentance and trust, the judgment will fall. And in the case of this prophecy, it did fall some years later. Well, let's turn now to the bulk of chapter 1 and the first uh, little section of chapter 2. <clears throat> Look with me at the way the text is laid out here. Between chapter 1, verse 3, and chapter 2, verse 3, there are six paragraphs, and each begins, thus says the Lord. And each paragraph announces the Lord's judgment against one of the Gentile nations that bordered the lands of Israel and Judah. So we start in chapter 1, verse 3, with Damascus, the capital of Syria. Next in verse 6, Amos turns to Gaza, uh, one of the principal cities of the Philistines. Then in verse 9, we go to Tyre, which was a wealthy coastal city further north towards the Lebanon. Then in verse 11, we go to Edom, which lay to the south and east of the Dead Sea. Then to the Ammonites in verse 13, who lived just to the east of the River Jordan, and then in chapter 2, verse 1, to Moab, which lay between the territories of Ammon and Edom. So we'll look at these six judgments against the Gentiles. Each of them follows the same formula or pattern. So let's take verse 3 as an example. Thus says the Lord, 
For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So in the first half of the verse, and this is true of each of these sections, the Lord says, for three transgressions of so-and-so and and for four. Now that is simply a verbal device designed to attract the reader's attention and to make the point that there is multiple transgression in view. It's not something small, it's something very serious and very wicked and cannot be overlooked. And God says, I will not revoke the punishment. He's made up his mind. Then in the second half of the verse, you'll see that the sin of the nation in question is described. So in verse 3, the Syrians in Damascus have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. Then the next section of the oracle, verses 4 and 5, describe what God is going to do to the people of Damascus as he judges them. And in each oracle, the words of judgment begin with the phrase, so I will send a fire upon whichever is the principal city of that area. And that phrase, you'll see, is repeated in verse <clears throat> verse 7, verse 10, verse 12, verse 14, chapter 2, verse 2, and chapter 2, verse 5. So it's a simple repeated pattern. In each case, the sin is described, and then the judgment is declared. So let's look at the nature of these sins. First of all, the Syrians of Damascus in verse 3. Ronnie, could you press a button or two and just send the map up into our view again for a moment, please? <clears throat> because you'll see that uh, in verse 3, Amos says, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. Now, the area of Gilead is really that area, it's, it's within Israel. In fact, it's a little bit further east, more or less east of the Sea of Galilee and running up towards Syria, up in the northeastern part of the country. And the Ammonites, we're going to see later, also attacked that part. It was a rather vulnerable part of Israel from the east. Thanks very much, Johnny. So they threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. Now, Amos could be referring there to a literal barbaric form of punishment in which a heavy threshing sledge with iron teeth was actually dragged across people who were lying on the ground. More likely, it's a metaphorical description of the cruel way that the Syrians were oppressing a people weaker than themselves, pillaging the countryside, exploiting them without mercy, and perhaps uh, imposing unbearable rates of tax upon them. Could that sort of behavior possibly be happening anywhere in the world today? Verse 6, the Philistines of Gaza. Gaza was then where it is still today the Gaza Strip. Now, what have they been doing? Well, verse 6, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them up to Edom. Slave trading. Not just a few individuals caught and sold, but a whole people. Thousands, families, mothers and children included, no doubt. A whole people uprooted by Philistine slave traders and forced to journey into the land of Edom. Slave traders. That's been going on over the centuries. It still goes on. I have a big world atlas at home, and if I open my atlas at the map of the western part of Africa, there's a chilling entry uh, on that particular page. There's a long stretch of coastline in Western Africa that stretches from Liberia for about a 1,000 miles through the Ivory Coast, Ghana, Togo, Benin, and then into Nigeria. And there are four entries on my atlas next to, to that stretch of coastline. Grain Coast, Ivory Coast, Gold Coast, Slave Coast. We know who the slaves were and we know who enslaved them. Verse 9. For three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So again, it's a slave trading thing, and again, these slaves are taken to Edom, which was obviously a center of the slave trade. But there's another element mentioned here. An international treaty has been broken. The people of Tyre 
have conveniently overlooked what Amos calls a treaty of brotherhood. Now, we know this sort of treaty. It happens today, doesn't it? Uh, international leaders get together. They meet in some important-looking building. They sign papers. They have long discussions. They come out at the end. They smile for the photo opportunity. They shake hands. They kiss each other on both cheeks. You think that uh, everything is sealed forever. But a few years later, they act as though the treaty has never been signed. Does that happen today? I don't suppose the Russians could do that, could they? I don't suppose the British could do it, could we? Don't become a senior diplomat unless you're willing to stand by your promises. Verse 11. For three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity, and his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. Sometimes, as we know, the worst of quarrels happen within families, and this seems to be a case of family hostility. The Edomites were descended from Esau, the brother of Jacob. Jacob. And if you think of the story in Genesis, Jacob and Esau had a terrible... Well, it was, wasn't really a row. Esau decided he was going to kill Jacob because he felt that Jacob had robbed him of his birthright, which in a sense he had. There was a reconciliation between the two brothers many years later, but somehow there seems to have been bad blood between the descendants of Esau and the people of Israel forever afterwards. The Edomites, and this surfaces in various places in the Old Testament, the Edomites seem to have harried and harassed the Israelites whenever they had opportunity. And verse 11 makes the point that there was a constant nagging hatred nursed by the Edomites against Israel, a perpetual anger. It's a chilling phrase, isn't it? A perpetual anger. Don't we see just that kind of thing in the Muslim world between Shia and Sunni today? An anger that goes on from generation to generation. Doesn't this kind of generational antagonism lie somewhere in the heart of Belfast? Covered over, eased a bit in recent years, but not yet eradicated. Verse 9 tells us what God thinks of these antagonisms. Verse 13, the Ammonites, I will not revoke the punishment uh, from them because they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead that they might enlarge their border. The Ammonites wanted more territory. They wanted more land. So they too marched into Gilead and they were willing even to rip open pregnant women as they created slaughter and carnage in their thirst for territory. Now warfare is one thing. And nations sometimes have to go to war. But this kind of atrocity described here in this verse is a different thing. And I don't need to remind you of the sickening atrocities that are happening every week in different parts of the world today, where people are treating each other with unimaginable cruelty. But verse 13 tells us that God will not fail to punish such things. Chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> For three transgressions of Moab... And for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. Now, this verse records an act of sacrilege. It seems that the army of Moab, on one occasion, captured the king of Edom in battle. But they didn't merely execute him and then give his body decent burial. They then, having killed him, subjected his corpse to the indignity of being burned to powder. Now, we used to behave in just this kind of way, didn't we, in England and Scotland. It wasn't enough simply to execute an enemy leader. We had to hang him, draw him, and quarter him, chop off his head, stick it on a spike on the city wall so that everybody could look at it and gloat over it. Now, friends, <clears throat> we have to ask, why should God, as it were, force us to read about these sickening episodes did God have to go into all this detail? Couldn't he just have spoken in more general terms about human wickedness without forcing us to think about these appalling particulars? Well, perhaps we're helped to answer the, these questions by thinking of the way that Jesus spoke about sin. Jesus did not simply say, the heart of man is nasty and sinful. Jesus went into painful particulars. He said this, out of the heart of man come 
evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. If you were here a week or two ago for the Mark drama, you will have seen that very vividly portrayed. Jesus says, all these things come from within and they defile a person. He rubs it home, you see, because naturally we will always want to avoid thinking quite as starkly about it. The Apostle Paul is just the same. He says this in 2 Timothy. In the last days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. So why does the Bible rub our faces in human sin like this? Wouldn't it be kinder of God simply to say, oh, the human race is a rather imperfect bunch, but I love them all the same? No, it would not be kinder. If the Bible glossed over our sinfulness with a few words like that, we would never be made to face up to the gruesome depths of which we are actually capable. You and I, friends, we who are sitting here in this building tonight, you and I are capable of murder, rape, atrocity, and violence. And if you haven't yet realized that, you don't know yourself. But when the Bible begins to expose the ruthless depths of the human heart, we begin to see why we need a savior. We begin to cry out, Lord, have mercy on me. And then, when we see the Savior that God has sent us, we're overwhelmed with a sense of joy and relief that God should have loved us and cared about us so deeply, despite what we are. The Bible is nothing if not radical. We need a radical diagnosis of our condition. And a book like Amos holds up a mirror to us and helps us to see what we're really like and helps us to see how far our Savior had to reach down to us so as to pluck us from the fire, to pluck us from the destruction that we deserve. Now let's notice two other things which clearly emerge from this first chapter of the book of Amos. The first concerns the standard by which God judges these pagan nations. Now these pagan nations, of course, did not have the Old Testament they didn't have what the people of Judah and Israel had, the revelation of God given to Moses at Mount Sinai. They didn't have the Ten Commandments. And yet, God holds them responsible and is going to judge them on a basis other than that of the Old Testament law. By what standard, then, does God judge them? Well, the Apostle Paul helps us here, particularly in Romans chapter 2, where he says... When Gentiles, who do not have the law, the law of Moses, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. In other words, they provide a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law of Moses. They show that the work of God's law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Now, do you see what Paul is saying there? The Gentile nations don't have the law of Moses, but they have a powerful and sufficient equivalent. God has written the requirements of his law on their hearts and consciences. They don't need the law of Moses to tell them that murder and violence and atrocity are wrong. They know it. It's written into the very nature that God has given them. And by this law, written on their hearts and consciences, God will judge them, and he will judge them fairly. Now, going back to Amos chapter 1, it's striking that God does not charge any of these Gentile nations with the sin of idolatry. They were, of course, all idolaters, idol worshippers. That's always been the way of the world. 
But the sins of Amos chapter 1 are crimes against humanity, the kind of crimes that get tried today at the court of, of human, um, human rights in The Hague, crimes that violate the love and care that nations ought to show to each other. So there is a universal standard by which God judges the nations. We cannot, judge, we cannot charge God, therefore, with unfairness. The hearts and consciences of every man and woman bear the imprint of what is right and wrong in the sight of God. Then secondly, it's obvious from Amos chapter 1 that God judges not only individuals but also whole societies and nations. Now, of course, God was able to identify individual men and women in Damascus or Gaza or Tyre who dissented from the will of their leaders and who sought to live a righteous life. In just the same way, God identified Lot and his family in Sodom. <coughs> but the presence of such individuals was not enough to hold back God's judgment. Now, surely it's the same today. God knows the hearts of individual men and women, but he assesses and weighs nations, and he will judge each nation and society according to its behavior. There is, therefore, a moral component in human history, and woe betide us if we disregard it. We have a general election coming up in just a couple of weeks, as we know well. We need to ask if our political leaders are seeking in any way to bring genuine moral considerations to bear upon their policies. If they don't, human history becomes merely the product of shifting social and economic forces without anything of the imprint of the law of God upon them. And when we listen to some, I wouldn't want to say all, but to some of our political leaders, weaving and ducking as May the 7th approaches, holding out a little economic sweetener here and a tax incentive there, we have to ask whether godly values play any part in our politics or whether the whole country has sold its soul to mammon. So, friends, let's take comfort that the Bible shows us that God has a court greater than the court of human rights at The Hague. No atrocity escapes his notice. No foul policy of oppression or murder is unseen by him. He was not ignorant of the policies of Adolf Hitler or Stalin or Mao Zedong. He knows how those men and their regimes murdered tens of millions of their own countrymen. He knows the wickednesses of the 20th century and those of the 21st. Our hearts deeply yearn that justice should be done in relation to all these things. And God shows himself to be a God who deals justly and with true retribution against every horrible deed. It is a great comfort to us to know that things of that kind, which seem not to get their redress in this life, will be addressed at the end. God is the judge of all the earth. That's the message of Amos chapter 1. And his judgment did indeed fall on all these Gentile nations some 40 years after Amos's day, as the Assyrian armies invaded and subdued all these territories around the promised land, including the land of Israel. Now, God is also the judge of his own people, and we shall see that next week as we look at the next section in this book. <coughs> but knowing that God is like this, that he sees everything and judges everything, how glad we are that he has sent us a saviour who will deliver us on the day of judgment because we are sinful men and women. Let's pray, therefore, that many more in our country will turn to that one and only Saviour, how that Saviour loves us to have done what he has done for us. And let's be assured he is the only one who is able to deliver us from the wrath to come. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord Jesus, our Saviour, we speak to you this evening and we want to thank you so much that you came, that those who come to you and put their trust in you should have life and have it abundantly in all its fullness and glory, forgiveness, 
unitedness with yourself and with God the Father and with all those who are redeemed. And we think of those, that uncountable number who are gathered around the throne of grace, <clears throat> the throne of, uh, of the universe in heaven, gathered around you and around God the Father, praising you and noticing that the marks of slaughter are still upon you there in the heavenly places. How we thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving us from the judgment. And we pray that you will give us fresh courage and joy as we declare this good news to many. And we ask it to the honor and praise of your great name. Amen. Well, our final hymn is a hymn of praise to the one Savior, our Savior Jesus. It's number 625, 625 in our hymn books. Jesus, the name high over all in hell or earth or sky, angels and men before it fall and devils fear and fly. Number 625. words of John the Baptist, 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We praise you, gracious Lord Jesus, that you have come for that very purpose. And we pray that you will write the full assurance of it deep in our hearts. And help us this week to honor you, to love you, and to praise you by life and by lip. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen.